very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to tech geek webinar series our endeavor to empower techies we believe that sharing of knowledge is the key of enhancing our performances and for our growth as professionals with this principle in mind tech geek has initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give a crisp insight of various domains today's session is sixth in the mobile app development series giving insights into building twitter app and cloud to device messaging in android our guest speaker today is mr rohit gatol associate architect at quick office mr rohit is currently involved in building the saas based platform and native office suite in android for quick office his areas of expertise are web 2.0 android enterprise solution using spring cross mobile or desktop platform products He has been a technical speaker at various events also doubles as a corporate speaker Rohit was earlier been part of open social team at Google He is a founder of Pune GTUG and Technext He is currently writing a book on beginning foot phone gap for Epress Rohit has overall 10 years of experience and is also a certified scrum master Gentlemen this presentation will continue for the next 2 hours and we'll take your questions at the end of the presentation in the meanwhile you can post your queries on the chat pane available in the webinar software without further ado i introduce you to our guest speaker mr rohit Uh, everybody, uh, but, uh, thanks for introducing me that way. It was really kind of you. So right, I'm ready to start my presentation. Um, just one question to you guys: uh, Are you able to see my screen? Sure, sure. Yes, we can. Okay. So the topic today is about uh, you know Android Twitter app, uh, developing Android Twitter app, and how to go about programming um, cloud to device messaging, and the question which you will have in your mind uh, is you know why am i talking about these two uh, things together so twitter app is a different kind of application and uh, you know c2dm is a cloud to device push so so right now i'm showing you a screen which uh, has the same question it says why twitter app and c2dm in the same talk and uh, the answer really uh, is simple because there are two ways in which uh, mobile applications or any client applications can communicate to the server one is uh, in which applications can keep on polling the server after every 5 10 15 minutes whatever the user has configured the second way is where the server tells the client that uh, okay i have got update for you and the client doesn't have to poll it's because of these two reasons you know we are talking about these two topics in a same presentation so moving on to uh, the topic of uh, twitter app demo and uh, let me know when you see my uh, emulator screen in front of you so i just launched my emulator screen i just wait till the time you guys catch up and you can see my emulator screen because i am going to show you a live demo of uh, my twitter application it's a very cut down version of the twitter application but it does has a uh, you know all the required things which you need to do so bharat can you see my screen waiting to see your emulator okay okay fine i'll just wait till that time so i'll just keep on talking till till, till that time so um when you talk about twitter um uh, yep we got the emulator has a, a unique way of authentication which is okay so twitter has a unique way of authenticating um, so it doesn't it doesn't support uh, basic authentication anymore so typically when you have uh, Twitter kind of services they are typically restful services, and that means you need to authenticate and uh, tell the services who you are before you can start fetching your information. While many of the applications uh, who has restful services, uh, they do support basic authentication. Basic authentication has uh, security concerns. That's why we go for OAuth. So what I'm going to do is on my emulator, I'm just going to click on my authenticate using Twitter screen, and you'll see instead of uh, the application. asking me for a username and password i have been taken to a browser and this is the browser is opening up 
Twitter screen and it's reading out, uh, you know, uh, authorize the CPA application to use your account. Uh, Twitter is asking me, you know, if you give permission to this application, it will allow it uh, to read tweets from your timeline. It will see who follows you and you can follow new people. It can upgrade your profile and it can also send tweets on your behalf. So uh, the screen which I'm showing right now has uh, an authorized app button. So when I click on this, that means I'm telling Twitter website to give authority to my application, my Android application, to actually go and read information. So what happens after a while is uh, the browser redirects to another page and that redirects back to my application. So Bharat, can you see a screen which has tweets on it? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, guys, I'll be just confirming with Bharat about each screen because I can't talk with all of you. So I'll keep on asking Bharat this question and assume that you guys are following at the same speed as Bharat is. So here we can see number of tweets and uh, I can also send a new tweet from over here saying this is a live tweet from TechGeek. And when I post this tweet, this application will actually post that tweet to Twitter and also refresh uh, itself to reflect the same thing. Now you can see uh, in a moment that uh, you can see this is a live tweet from TechGeek being shown on the top. And hopefully you're able to follow me up and see that. Now what I will do in a moment is I will actually switch to my Twitter account and I'm going to post something over here saying this is a tweet which I entered from Twitter. So right now I'm actually on Twitter homepage and pushing this tweet and what I expect is my application to notify me that somebody has you know given you a new tweet so just you know open the application and, and follow it up. So I'm just posting my tweet from uh, Twitter website and I'm going back to my monitor. So even if you're skipping it, don't worry about it. I've already posted uh, the tweet from my Twitter account on a Twitter website. And now you shall see a, T, um, a Twitter thing on top. So Bharat, just confirm me whether you can see the notification on the top saying T. Uh, actually, I'm able to see the Twitter page. Now I got the notification. Right. Okay, so it will take a look. I'll, I'll just let me just ping me and tell me when you see the email back so you know people will notice along with you. So what's happening over here is uh, this application is you know kind of polling everyone one minute. It's checking every one, one minute whether uh, we have a new tweet or not and that's a polling um, mechanism which I'm using and this poll can be configured to be 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever we want. For this demo I kept it at one minute. So uh, whenever you see the email screen you will see that uh, this icon appears on top and uh, that's a typical Android view of notification. Right, we see the emulator. Okay, now I'm going to push down that uh, notification and I'm going to click on top of that and that notification is going to take me back to uh, the Twitter application. Okay. So that's uh, the pretty much a demo of things on you know, what this application does and uh, you know it's straightforward, it's, there's nothing uh, rocket science in that. So what I'll do now is I'll get back to the presentation and we'll talk in theory about the overall architecture of this application and how this application uh, behaves. So I'm going back to my slide and I'm navigating to a page where uh, I'm talking about Twitter requirements. So meanwhile the page loads up, I'll still keep on talking and telling you about the basic requirements which we have. The first requirement which we have is uh, the OAuth authentication. And, I'll, uh, and for people who don't know what OAuth is, I'll cover that up in uh, upcoming slides. So I'll cover that up in uh, you know, a layman language after some slides and we'll go in detail in exactly what OAuth is and how to do OAuth at Twitter inside Android and what are the challenges with it. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, fetching tweets and so showing them in list view. We'll also talk about a typical problem which people face on Android uh, application is when you have a list view showing list of uh, data 
and there's a thumbnail which is a, uh, which is an image on the internet. How do you show it effectively? So that problem doesn't appear on iPhone because iPhone natively handles it. But for Android, you have to do things effectively to you know make sure that's smooth. Then there's a requirement of sending the tweets, which is very straightforward. And then there's a requirement for background sync, and uh, you know and uh, periodically uh, fetching tweets from the application and notification. So these are the basic requirements. So Bharat, uh, which page do you see on the presentation? I see the Twitter requirements page slide. Okay, so I'm going to the next page, uh, which, so before I go to the architecture, what I want to do quickly, I'm very sure that, you know, all you guys already know Android to an extent, but I still want to ensure that you guys don't uh, lose or lose or anything, and that's why I'll start with uh, three slides of, you know, basic building blocks of Android and talk to you about them so that there's no confusion. The slide I'm talking about is called as an activity lifecycle. I'm very sure anybody of you who has done Android to a bit, all he knows about activity lifecycle. So activity is a uh, is a class which show, which represents the screen in Android. It's a class which represents the UI. So anything which you have ultimately is an activity, and in the activity you have buttons and layouts and things like that. Now activity lifecycle has six methods. So when you start from on create method to on destroy method, that's a complete lifecycle of the activity. That means uh, on create is only called once, and that's why we do the one time things like resting to button events or, or getting some it's a layout inflator and things like that once in the life cycle of the activity. So all this one time things will do in on create. Now on start to on stop is called when the activity is completely visible, uh, is, is actually visible uh, on the screen. And on resume to on pause is called when the activity is before on top of any other activity or either which is on the screen. So typically on start and on resume will stick together because uh, most of the Android applications are full, full screen applications. So you will never see a difference between on start and on resume. So immediately after on start is called, on resume is also called. Now uh, what happens is the example of on resume to on pause, foreground life cycle is when your activity is running, an alarm pops over that. And the alarm is a small window. So in that case, only on pause is called. On stop is not called. And when the alarm goes away, on resume is called again. For everything else which is full screen, and the complete activity goes in background, you have you on stop is called. So this is typically the life cycle activity of Android. So moving to the uh, next thing, next uh, slide, it is about uh, services. So typically in Android, we, we use services for background processing. Uh, that everybody knows, but the main thing which we want to talk about is how do you use services. There are two ways to use the services. One is a mechanism which I will call as fire and forget, where let's say an activity calls a service by calling start service and passing the intent. And the same intent, the activity can put in name value pairs, okay, data, and fire it. When this happens, the services on start command is called. And each time I call start service, the services on start command is called. So that's the way, you know, services can be fired. And this is the way services should be fired to do actual background processing. So if I'm invoking my services uh, every five to 10 minutes in a background, I would choose to call it by this mechanism, which is fire and forget. Uh, the reason I call it fire and forget is because the service can't communicate back to the activity what's happening. The second method is to actually do a bind service. And in the bind service, what happens is the service implements an interface and uh, the activity gets the interface. So it's like calling remote calls on the service. So notice that in the service, I've got these two methods called as foo and bar, and bar returns int. I'm showing that on purpose because when activity gets access to this uh, implementation of a service, it can just call bar and get the integer value back. So this is the way in which uh, services uh, can be called as RPC calls, remote procedure calls. So this is another way of calling it, and in our case, our activity will be calling the services in this manner. The third thing which I want to talk about, and then we'll move on to the uh, actual, uh, what do you call, design of the application is, um, is events which are shown in Android. So on the left-hand side, I've shown the Android OS itself, which is showing out events like network change, battery, uh, battery low, uh, call, and roaming. These are very important events. <laughs> Because uh, whenever, let's say I'm having a Dropbox application and I am outside my roaming area 
and uh, the, the, the data plans is going to cost me extra. So I don't want Dropbox to download data, especially when I'm on, when I'm on roaming, or even when network changes from 2G to 3G to Wi-Fi. I need to be notified. Also, when the battery is low, I won't want to do such certain things and things like that. Even phone boot is an event which I'll be interested in. So these are the intense uh, events which Android OS can show, and uh, Likewise, other applications can also show e events. For example, Facebook can show an event saying, yeah, I've got a new uh, post on a wall. Twitter can show this intent that I've got a new tweet. And other applications can listen to it. So this is the whole mechanism of broadcast receivers. So application needs to implement the broadcast receiver and register it with Android to receive all these interesting events. So that's all about uh, the basic building block. And uh, now I'm moving over to a screen which talks about the overall you know, architecture of uh, Twitter application. So whenever that screen comes up, you will see that uh, I've depicted a couple of screens, and I have also noted uh, which all services I have, whether I'm using application database. I've also talked about a couple of uh, broadcast receivers on the same screen. So this screen is not a UML screen or not anything. It's just a block like a diagram kind of screen. So Bharat, can you see a screen which talks about uh, phone boot? Yes, I can see that. And alarm I can receiver? see that. I'll keep pinging you on the chat, which is a chat window okay. over there. Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> Please do that. Thanks. Okay. So um, instead of me explaining, you know, all the components. Uh, um, right now, what I'll do is I'll walk you through each and every scenario, and we'll look at you know, uh, what happens. So I'm moving to the next screen, which uh, talks about uh, OAuth authentication. It talks about authentication. So in this screen, what I'm doing is uh, it's the same diagram. I'm just you know highlighting the components which uh, come into play uh, with this red border. So in this screen, you will see that the first screen which I had was a splash screen which showed a droid icon and uh, a button called as Authenticate Twitter using OAuth. Now when I click on that button, it takes me to the browser. The browser actually takes me to Twitter and that's where I authenticate and the browser gets me back to uh, you know, uh, my own application with certain tokens. And now I can use these tokens to fetch uh, uh, tweets from Twitter. So that's what I'm showing in this screen where you can see the Droid screen and the browser screen in, uh, in, uh, in the red Waters. Now, when, it, when we launch the application first time, let's look at what happens during that time. So what happens during that time is you can see now that from uh, the bright screen, the, the login screen or the splash screen, I move to this tweet screen. And uh, at the same time, what I'm doing is I'm telling Android's alarm manager that, okay, poke my application, let's say every five minutes or 10 minutes, so that, you know, I can, the application can wake up and it can, uh, it can uh, you know, go and fetch new data from Twitter. So that's the screen which I'm show showing where the alarm clock is red and below I'm talking about uh, first time application loads uh, enables the alarm manager. So that's the screen where, where I am right now. So it's very important to do it uh, right the first time when you launch the application so that the application can do background processing and keep on fetching your new tweets. Now I'm going to the screen uh, which talks about uh, asking services to fetch tweets. So what ha happens is first time I launch, I set the alarm manager, but I do one more thing. Now here, my activity actually, the activity actually talks to the service. And in, in this case, uh, so this is depicted by my tweet screen in a red border, and my service and my app DB and the Twitter API also in a red border. So that's the screen which I'm on. So uh, I'll keep on talking, talking until the screen comes up and you can follow me through. So what happens in this case is my activity binds to the service and it tells the service that, okay, go fetch new tweets. And this is a special call. This only happens the first time because next time whenever my activity should be talking to service, my service should already be having the data in the database. So uh, it's a bind call and I'll actually make a RPC call on my service and do those kind of things. So this is what happens. So what happens is Twitter goes to uh, so service goes to Twitter, loads the tweets, 
one dumps it in application database and returns a list of tweets to the activity. So this this is where my activity starts showing uh, the tweets. Now we will go to the next screen, which will talk about uh, you know the background processing. Now I already talked about this that my application launch and it uh, set the alarm manager, and my alarm manager will poke my service uh, every ten minutes or my application every ten minutes. So let's see how this would happen. So I'm going to the screen where you can see that the alarm manager uh, pokes my application. But it's important to know what it pokes in the application. So that's why I refer a broadcast receiver. So I set a broadcast receiver telling that the alarm manager should call the broadcast receiver every 10 minutes. And the broadcast receiver, which is the alarm receiver which you can see below, is the one which will actually uh, you know, poke the service. So if you do a start, active, start service on the service, so it's a fire and forget uh, you know, uh, request given to the service. And now the service will go to Twitter, fetch new information, compare with the database whether it has new information or this information is stale. And if the information is new, it, it will uh, pop up a notification on the notification bar. And when I pull that notification below and I click on it, it will open the tweets uh, screen. Now, uh, the next thing which we need to do uh, is talk about a situation where uh, my phone actually, after I installed my application, my phone actually went down. Uh, it got drained and I charged it again, so my phone rebooted. Now, here I'm not going to launch the application again to start an alarm manager. So I want that uh, 10 minutes loop you know, going in the background, which is you know, telling my service to fetch new tweets happening automatically. So what happens in that case is uh, I have already registered a broadcast receiver with Android which listens for phone boot events. So whenever the phone boots, it, it's going to call the broadcast receiver of my application. And remember, the broadcast receiver call is actually just a callback. So, so Android will just call it back. And here, I'll do two, two things. I will set my alarm manager to poke my service after every five to 10 minutes. And I'll also set one more broadcast receiver call as battery, low battery receiver. I'll talk about this in a while, but it's important that your application boots, you know, sets itself when the phone boots. So this is what you're going to do over here. Now, the next thing is why are we listening to the battery low event? Now, it's very important. Your application needs to be a good citizen and behave properly uh, amongst other Android applications which you have. So let's say, uh, you know, let's say it's a policy that, you know, that not a policy, it's a uh, typical mindset that uh, my phone needs to be used for phones more when my battery is low than to check my tweets. Let's say that's the general mindset which we have and we have configured this uh, thing in our application. So let's say if my battery is running low and my battery is less than 20%, should I really keep on pinging uh, Twitter to find out what are the latest tweets and all? If it's not so critical, I wouldn't want to do that. That's what we are de depicting in this screen, where the low battery receiver will, you know, disable the alarm rec receiver and say, "Okay, boss, you don't need to do this anymore. Just wait because the battery is pretty low." And when the phone is put on charging and the phone charges above 20 percent, again the low battery receiver kicks in, saying, "Okay, alarm manager, you can now start pinging the service to go ahead and, uh, you know, fetch new tweets." So this is the overall architecture which we have uh, in our case. So like I mentioned before, I will explain OAuth to people who do not understand OAuth. So that's the screen which I'm going to. So the screen which I'm moving to, uh, here I'm taking an example of the popular photo uh, photo uh, shop in India called PhotoFast. This is a, it's just a cook-up example. So let's say I go to PhotoFast. Uh, the first screen shows that I've got a username and password. I enter the username and password on PhotoFast. I log inside, and then I'm given an option that you want to print the photographs, but where are your photographs? And it gives the option that, okay, if your photographs are in Picasso or on Flickr, probably I can get them for you. So I say, that's cool. I'm just going to say hit Picasso. And on the next screen, what happens is I'm still on PhotoFast, and it tells me, can you give me your Picasso username and password? And that sets, a, that sets an alarm in my head. That's not right. If I go to a restaurant, do I give the waiter my ATM card and my PIN code? 
that's not what I do. I actually give my credit card and I sign over it. So that's just crazy. Why should I share my Picasa credentials with PhotoFast, especially when it's Google credentials and can be used across a number of services? And that's not right at all. So this is not done. Um, but remember, this was a fact a couple of years back, two, three years back, this was a common practice, especially uh, uh, by services which wanted to fetch your friends, Gmail friends or Yahoo friends or other friends and invite them onto the network. But this is a dangerous thing to do, sharing your credentials with somebody else. So that's not done. So let's do take two action. Let's try it again. Now here, we're doing the same thing. And I'm on PhotoFast. I log in to PhotoFast. I'm being asked again whether Picasa or Flickr, where do you want to choose a photograph from? And this time, what happens is I'm being given a different screen. And in this screen, instead of me still being on PhotoFast and PhotoFast asking me for username and password, I've been taken to Picasa.com. And, and Picasa is asking for me for username and password. And I say, that's cool. I don't have any issues. It's Picasa itself asking for me. But when I log in, something different happens. Now, Picasa is aware why I'm coming to Picasa. So it tells, it's asked me this question directly, which albums do you want to share with PhotoFast? And I choose amongst this one, two, three, four, five, six albums, I'm going to choose album number one and two. So that's what will happen. I'll choose that and I'll basically hit, uh, you know, I'll hit the button. And this time I'll go back to photofast.com and here PhotoFast will now start showing me Picasso's albums, okay? All the photographs in Picasso's album I share. And now I can choose and print from PhotoFast. And that's what OAuth really is. So technically, I won't talk about it much uh, because it's out of scope for this presentation. But uh, it's simple. It's just redirection from one site to another site to do authentication. And because I'm re redirected to another site, which I trust, I'm happy to put in my username and password. Now, let's talk about how does it really happen inside Android for Twitter. Now, there are a couple of things which you need to understand about uh, you know, doing OAuth inside Android application. First of all, it's not straightforward. First thing is that your application launch, your application's activity launches, and suddenly you need to go to uh, a browser where uh, the browser takes you to the site and you log in over there. And now the browser has to take you back to uh, uh, your activity, which is not even natural for the browser. So how do we do all these things? is really the question in our case. So to answer that question, what we'll do is uh, we'll just walk through the code and uh, you know, see what all steps do I need to take to actually to do this Twitter authentication. And uh, I'll explain in each step what is actually happening. So to begin with, the first step is that you need to register yourself with Twitter, uh, with a developer account to get the initial award tokens. Now this token and uh, these tokens are required um, by your applications to tell uh, uh, to tell Twitter that okay it's your application which is pinging them and Twitter knows about uh, your developer account and all this. So once you go to Twitter, uh, you can uh, create your own app and there you will get this access token and access token secret, which we need to actually code in into your application before you send things uh, to Twitter. The next step is, uh, like I talked about it, you know, uh, it's easy for me to open a browser from my application because it's simply uh, launching an intent. It's simply saying, you know, create an intent and that I want to browse this URL and say start activity. That will, uh, that will in that case, Android will yell out and will receive browser as the application which can handle that particular intent. So it will open that. But that part is done. But the difficult part is, when Twitter actually does the authentication, Twitter so so when you go to Twitter and say, I want to authenticate with you, you also give Twitter something called as a callback URL. So if you talk about the web, let's say I've got a, I'm at abc.com, and from there I say log in using Twitter. When I'm creating this URL, somewhere in the URL I'm saying that there's a callback URL, which is again abc.com. So I go to Twitter purposefully, I redirect to Twitter, and Twitter does authentication. Then Twitter looks at the callback URL, and it redirects the browser to the callback URL with the keys. So same thing will happen, but in our case, instead of saying um, you know HTTP abc.com, we can't say that because HTTP requests are handled by the browser. So HTTP is a scheme in the HTTP 
slash abc.com. Um, in our case, when we talk about a URL called as droid tweet colon slash slash tweet, that's a very specific URL with the scheme as droid tweet. And what we will be doing is we will tell our activity that uh, you need to handle any browsable category you know, requests. Okay. Especially when the schema is droid tweet and when the host is tweet. So when the browser redirects to droid tweet uh, colon slash slash tweets, it's my activity which gets called. And in this case, I'm launching the activity in single task mode because I don't want to launch a new activity. So here's how it goes actually. My activity launches browser and browser again launches my activity. But I don't want two instances of my activity. That's why I say single task. Uh, so the next step is to actually create the the URL which I was talking about. So in this case, you can see in the red that my callback URL is droid tweet tweet. And uh, when I click on the button, which is the login button, I'm creating this uh, you know OAuth signpost client. So this, here I'm using the OAuth library. I won't go deep into that because there's a lot of documentation for that. But I'll talk about more the concept on how we do this. So ultimately, I get a URL. I launch my browser. My browser gets launched. The last step is to handle this uh, event or intent which you get from the browser. So when the browser calls you back, because you're single task, it won't call your on create. And we made it single task because I don't want it to call on create because if it calls my on create again, that means I've got two instances of uh, my activity. I only want one. So because it can't call on create, it will call my on new intent again. Now. In on new intent, I'll get an intent, and from the intent, I'll get a uh, OAuth uh, verifier uh, parameter, and from there, I'll get the access tokens which I need to use while actually fetching the tweets. Now, I won't go into the part of fetching the tweets because that's pretty straightforward. It's a RESTful call, or you can use a Twitter library. In our case, we are using a Twitter library where we are actually specifying this to a token and secret, and things work out straight. So the focus was more on the breadth, and the focus in this presentation will be on more on the breadth uh, because the entire code examples are available online. Uh, there's a reference at the end of this presentation where you, where you find all that. But the main part which I wanted to tell you was how this OAuth works given you have an activity in a browser. So activity launches the browser, browser launches the activity back because the activity is registered for a different kind of intent which is browsable and the schema is right tweet and the host is tweet. So here's a, here's a screen where I'm talking about uh, a complete uh, blog on uh, how to do OAuth with Android. Uh, it's pretty much explained in detail. And because I'm covering more of a breadth, I choose not to go in the depth part of it. And I hope you guys uh, are OK with that. Now, the second thing which I'm going to talk about is fetching from Twitter API. Now, here I'll be just giving some guidelines on what to do when you fetch from the Twitter APIs. And the first guideline which I want to tell you is, you know, try to keep the design very, very simple. So let's say if you have this module uh, called as fetch Twitter manager is your class, which is responsible for fetching your tweets. Uh, for people who are from G2W world or who have been who have done Ajax in the past, they had this habit of always, you know, making the HTTP request in an async manner. Now in this case we don't need to go that route because uh, we are on a flat client and we are able to do multi-threading so we don't really need to go that route. So this, uh, let's say this function which we have, get latest tweet, which returns a list of tweet. I'll tell you what this function should do. This function should open HTTP connection with Twitter, uh, use the earlier authentication keys, okay, put them in the headers and make a request to get the tweets. The tweets will be supplied back in a JSON format and the passing will also happen within this method. Okay, what do I need to do? Processing, passing needs to happen in a method. And ultimately, I need to get uh, the list tweets uh, from, from, from this method, basically. So it needs to be totally, totally, totally synchronous. So um, either you can make this, so you can, you can use this module either directly in, that, in your activity, or you can put this module in your services and call the service. But in either case, when you're doing this from your activity, make sure you use the same task for obvious reasons. Um, your lifecycle methods 
you know, the so Android is Android applications are, are, are single process, single threaded. So if your lifecycle methods take more than five seconds, Android will get annoyed and say something is going wrong over here. You shouldn't take this long, and that's why I'm going to ask the user to you know close it down. So if you want to do anything, you need to do it in background. But if you do these things in background, you can you can't touch the UI because you need to be in the main thread. So I think task is a way of doing that, and uh, it's a topic which is pretty much talked on the internet. And again, I'm covering more of a breadth than the depth. Uh, there are good examples, and and uh, if somebody really wants to see it, I can show it to them in two minutes. So let's talk about uh, showing these tweets in a list view. So this is an uh, interesting part. So in Android, we have this list view, uh, which whose responsibility is to show a list of items. And each item which is shown, I'm calling that container for that item as a plan in this presentation. So this we will show a, a plans, you know, which can be scrolled up and down on each on and on each plank you can have a text box, uh, you can have an image view, you can have something else, you can have any layout. So this list view functionality remains entirely same, you know, it's never changes. So that's the constant part. And uh, you can have a data in any particular manner. So your data can be um, let's say a list of tweets. It can be a special class called tweets. It can be something else. It can even be a tree kind of structure, whatever it is. So data is variable. Even the kind of layout which you want to show. So in my case, the layout is like this. On the left-hand side, I want to show a tweet uh, user icon. And on the right-hand side, I want to show the tweet entry. So that is shown below as entry 1. That's a text. So if you see, there's one part which is constant. There are two parts which are not constant. So I'm putting an adapter layer in, in between to let, uh, to, to adapt this data and this layout for this particular list view. So for this, we use a class called as a base adapter. And this is a class which, uh, which I'll explain in short. The contract is really, really very simple. So if you see the list view, the list view wants to show a list of plans. The first information which it wants to get from the data is how many entries are there to be shown in total. That's why my base adapter has this method called as get count, which I need to override. So in that, in, in my case, if I'm if I'm having a list of tweets, this will be you know list of tweets size. The second thing which my adapter needs to know is what is the data at what position. So in this case, it will be again list item, but you know, get item, give the index. So in the list interface, just use a get method, pass the position, and get the object. And remember, this is a generic thing because the object can be anything. Uh, the third method, which I need to override, is called as get item ID. It's just slightly difficult to uh, understand. See, as long as you have a list of things, as long as things are sequential, you just put in the position. If you have something like a tree or something else which is non-sequential, then you need to put a logic. But for this example, don't worry about this. We'll just talk about you know retaining a position over here. And the last method which is there, the get view method, that's the method which you know which uh, gives the layout, which gives the actual view to put on the on the on the plank. But uh, the question which some of you guys would have is uh, I can understand the position being passed, but why are we passing the convert view? And that's that doesn't make much sense. Why, why I'm passing the view again? So the second argument is actually convert. It's actually called as view convert view. So I'll talk about that in a in a moment. But uh, let me just uh, let me just open uh, my Eclipse and show you some things before I go there. This is my tweet adapter. So if I show you this example, I'll just show you the code. No, I'm not going to show the example running. So here you will see that uh, my view, get view, has this position and convert view and uh, view group parent. 
So here you will see that I'm passing this uh, convert view over here, and th what's the reason for that? So if you see, I'm checking that the convert view sometimes is null and sometimes it's not null. Now the reason behind that is very simple. I'll go back to a presentation and explain you that in a, in a diagrammatical fashion. And I hope you guys are following up over here. I hope I'm not making things complex for you, but the intention is to just make things simpler. So the reason get view has first argument as position and second argument as a, as, as a view called as convert view is because even if I want to show 10,000 uh, or 1,000 elements in a, in a thing, at one time, I can do that by just showing four plans. So if four plans are able to fill up the screen, I don't need 1,000 plans or 100 plans to show my data. Why is that so? Because when the first plan goes out of uh, the view, I can reuse it and put it back. And I can rub the data on that plan, and I can put new information on the plan. And that's what actually happens. This is why you only have you know, few plans there where there's a data could be anything. And this, is, this makes the whole uh, thing very lightweight because you don't have more objects. Now going back to my code, now you'll be able to understand the code. So I'll just wait for a while till you guys see this code. Uh, but here's the logic. The convert view which is passed will be null for the first four times because there's nothing being created. And that's why I'm checking for this uh, null check. It says if the convert view is null, then let's create the view from uh, a layout. Let's include it. And remember this is a costly operation and that's why we don't want to do it 100 times or 1000 times. You only want to do it for those main number of times for those four or five five planks. So this is where we do, the, do those things. And here I'm getting the object of tweet. And now here I'm basically rubbing the plank and putting new information on the plank. So here I'm getting the text view from a particular layout. Again, the text view from a particular layout and putting the information on top of that. So now I'm going back uh, to the presentation. I hope this switch is not too painful for you. <laughs> so going back to my presentation, I'm going to a typical problem which many people face, uh, which is called as, you know, which is referred to as showing thumbnails in a list view. Uh, this happens especially when your data, let's say tweet, now has uh, uh, the image URL, uh, the title, and the author name. So the author name and title I can show very easily because I have the data. But when it comes to showing the thumbnail, I have to have an image view. And the image view doesn't take a URL. An image view actually requires the data. So it's my code which needs to actually fetch the data and do it. So typically what happens is uh, people um, do this, and then it's a bad way of programming. In the adapter class, in the get view, whenever they, uh, they, they encounter this get view method, they start the thread and they start loading the image in the thread and they catch hold of the image view and they dump thing in the image view and the thread returns. There's a big problem with that because let's say you know, I'm launching a thread one, two, three, four, for entry one, two, three, four, and at the same time, I'm fetching things. And when I go to entry number five, which is again displayed on the first plank itself, and in this case, the image view is also the same. The, the image view in the layout, the blue thing is the same. My thread one returns and it says, okay, I have got an image so let me put it on the blue uh, image view in, in, you know, the plank one, which is marked by the red thing. So the red uh, circles, they are the plank numbers, and the entry entries are the, data, are the data numbers. So that's where I see a wrong information being shown. So I see a wrong icon being shown in a wrong way. Ultimately, things correct out because the other thread will asynchronously uh, come and it will show. But if two threads race and they, sh they show up at different positions, then you will obviously end up showing wrong image in in the list view. So this problem I'm talking about because you know I'm talking about all the problems which you will face when you're creating an application like Twitter, okay, which is a common problem. So how do you solve this problem? Solving this problem is pretty easy and uh, I'll also run you to the code in a while, uh, but before that you need to understand the nature of things. First of all the problem is uh, that I'm launching too many threads which is not good because when each, when which thread will return, I don't know. Second thing, there is no caching. So each time when I'm scrolling up and down, threads are being launched. 
the the third thing is uh, there is no uh, what do you call there is no mechanism to to ensure that okay I'm I'm putting the image at the proper position. So what I do is uh, all my so in my get view what I do is I start pushing some task into the blocking queue. So the the thing which you see in blue boxes, the four view boxes which you see are the queue. Is a queue. It's a blocking queue. Uh, the advantage of a blocking queue is when I do a while loop. Uh, I'll show it in a while to you. I'll just go to the next screen and show things to you. So what happens is uh, before I show anything, this is called a step number zero. Thank you. My tip call is, has a while loop going around, which says queue dot take, and this method is blocking because the queue is empty. So until the queue gets some information, my thread will just block over here. So now I have a single thread which just listens for, you know, is there any work for me? Is there any work for me? That's what it does, nothing else. But this is what happens before I'm showing uh, anything. I'm, I'm launching my screens. Now what happens is uh, my adapter's get view is called. So there I've, I put a task in the queue that you need to load this photo because I don't have this photo. Now immediately you see the red thing q.take in the while loop becomes green. And now I'm going to the next step which is fetch photo from the internet. And it's going to the uh, internet synchronously fetching the photo, no synchronous calls over here. And finally it gets the photo. And it puts the photo in the cache. So below you will see a local image cache. And the reason we want to use the cache is we don't want to go to the internet each time. And it also puts the red photo in the blue image view. That's how it works. And the next time, again, when it's trying to show the entry number two, again if you put a task in the queue, it will block at the queue.take. And this is how the things will keep on working. So the idea here is to use a blocking queue and let the adapter push information to the queue and let the thread do the work. But here's one more intelligent thing which we can do. Now, if I come back to, to entry one, if I scroll below, and if I scroll up again, I'm coming back to entry one. Now, I don't even need to go to the queue. I can just check in my image cache whether I have the image and use that. So these are the, some, of the, um, some of the classes which I created to solve this problem. The entire core example is available. I'll, uh, it's called a feed data example. That's available at the end of the presentation. You can go to that open source project and look at the entire example all by yourself. So I've got an image loader interface and I've got an image cache interface. And the reason I'm keeping this as, as an interface is because I can implement cache in any, any particular fashion. And same thing goes for image loading. And uh, there's a class called as photo to load, which I'm using, which is a tuple, which is a map between, which is a pair of URL versus image view. And uh, this is where you can see the complete example of queued image loader. I just run you to the code quickly. This is the so when you see the screen um, just ping me. So this is an example where we have a, a queued image loader. Uh, here you will see a blocking queue present which uh, wraps around photo to load. So it, it can contain objects of photo to load. And the moment I start this uh, loader, it starts as thread. So it does this thread.start which starts as while loop. And here I'll always block on this line, photos to load. And what happens is my adapter is calling this method in uh, get view. So my adapter says for this URL, this image view, please queue the image. And if it finds that thing in the cache, it takes it from a cache and does it. If it doesn't find anything, it will basically 
add a new object to the queue and the queue will now kick in from over here. It will actually go and load the bitmap, which you can so see over here is a HTTP call going and getting the bitmap and things are working out in that direction. So you can go through this code uh, in more detail in your time, but the concept is very, very simple. So I'm moving back to my presentation now. So next topic is uh, using the uh, services. So I'll hurry up on this topic. Uh, let's talk about two things, which is how to call services uh, in a fire and forget manner, and how to call the services in a in a bind manner. So I'll again go to my uh, my Eclipse for the same thing. So this example is available in a Droid project in complete details. So here, I uh, launch my military and I'm showing this service example with the symbol service example. And here, I'm just adding some values. It's a calculator service. So in this screen, um, what I have is just a text box and some buttons which are called as add and subtract and when I click on them it does the operations but what you will observe particularly in this screen is there's no feedback happening and that's happening because this is a fire and forget service because uh, whenever I do add, add 10 or add 20 nothing is shown to me on the screen itself so I can keep on doing this addition subtraction n number of times but nothing happens on my screen because I'm just trying to you know, fire and forget. So the example of that, source example of that can be seen over here. So I'm opening my Eclipse and I'm showing uh, simple service over there and here you will see that uh, all that happens is I'm implementing my on start command and in the intents I'm just looking at the intent and from the intent I'm basically getting two strings called as a, a, a action and an int as a data and depending on that I'm doing the operation and it just changes the internal state and in the log cat below you will see these messages coming over here, adding 10 to 60, new value is 70, adding 2 to 70, this is happening because the service is getting called. So implementing the service is very simple, all you need to do is just override on start command and do things. Let's see how do we call this service. So calling the service is very simple, all I do for calling the service, now I am in a class called a simple service example for Java, where I am creating this uh, this intent for simple service and I'm putting two data. One is action and one is data. So it's so simple to use. This is an example of simple service which is which we, which is being used from the alarm manager. So alarm manager calls a, a broadcast receiver and broadcast receiver calls this particular service. The second example which I'm going to show you on emulator is called as binding to service. So here, when I 
So here, I'll get feedbacks when I uh, put in some values. So we just wait for the email to show up. So here, whenever I do some addition or subtraction, I'll see some toast coming below. So result is 0, result is 20. So you can see result is 20, result is 21, result is 16. So you can see this toast coming below, whatever I do. So I'm getting feedback. Now the reason it works out is because of the nature of complex uh, or binding of the services. So I'll first of all show you the interface which the service is trying to share with uh, the activity. So all these interfaces for services have to be declared in a special file called as AIDL files and in this case I have these two methods in uh, uh, ITAL service interface one is uh, add and one is subtract. So don't, don't be fooled by the extension of this class which is AIDL. Um, what happens is uh, this class, this file is actually converted to a Java class so it's 90% Java when you're writing it. So there's, there's not enough, there's no difference when you talk about uh, you know this AIDL classes. So there's this add and subtract which are happening over here. So So here, what I do is, uh, in my in my service class, now instead of overriding my on start command, what I do is, I override my on bind. And here, think about this uh, portion which I highlighted as implementing the interface. Okay, and this is the same thing which will be shared with all the other uh, anybody who calls bind activity, bind service on this particular class. So they will get this implementation. So you see the INT value as a stateful nature of the service and you will see that here we are trying to add and subtract. So this is the bind service example. The way we call this is the one which uh, you guys will be interested in. So if you look at the on create method of my activity which calls this, I'm creating, I'm creating the service intent in a very similar fashion. I'm passing the application context and the service class name. But instead of saying start service, I'm saying bind service. And I'm passing the same intent. The last argument is bind auto create, which is, you know, create the service if it's not running. And the middle argument called connection is the callback. So the callback tells me two things. Whether I'm able to connect to the service or whether I'm not able to connect to the service or the connection is broken. So when I want to connect to the service, I can get the uh, get the object referring to the uh, implementation of that particular uh, interface. And in my button clicks, I can simply say cal service or add and cal service or subtract. So I can just call them as typical Java calls. So that's more or less what we're talking about services, just for your sake, covering it in more detail. Now going back to uh, presentation. We have got two, two more things to talk, talk about. One is how to use the alarm manager and second thing is how to use the battery event. So both of those examples are there with me over here itself. So let's just look at the alarm manager example. So you see in this case what I really have is uh, I have my activity which calls a method called a set alarm when if it's on create method. And this guy does something interesting. So what it does is it gets the alarm manager by calling get system service. And once it gets alarm manager, it will do two things. First of all, it will create this intent, okay, which is meant for a broadcast receiver. So the intent says you can call this broadcast receiver whenever this intent is fired. 
and to wrap this intent, insert another intent called as a pending intent. Okay, so this intent is meant for broadcast. So we are saying building intent dot get broadcast, and we are passing the original intent. So it's a wrapper intent towards the original intent, and then we are telling the alarm manager that okay, you please call this pending intent after the current time plus five seconds. So after five seconds, and every sixty thousand milliseconds. That is every six, every one minute. Call this intent. So what this guy will do is, once this is, this is set, it will call my alarm receiver, which is my broadcast receiver. So broadcast receiver has this method called as on receive, which is a callback method, and it's always a good practice to do whatever you do in this method in the in the thread, because if this takes more than ten seconds for some reason, you will get a ANR. So if, if I suspect this will take more time, I'll always do it in a thread. In this case, I'm just going to, to give you an example of a good practice. So here I'm trying to send a notification. Sending notification is also very simple. You get a notification manager from Get System Service. Then you create a notification, and this notification is uh, about which icon to show on a title bar and what is the message to show there. Then I'll create an intent. The intent is about you know calling my activity, and then I'll put a pending intent around it. Call this content intent. So I'll say pending intent to get activity because I want to launch activity, and uh, I'll wrap it around over there. Lastly, for a notification, I'll say that this is my title. You have new notification as a message, and content intent is the pending intent which you need to fire. So ultimately, it will fire the intent for the activity. And that's why you see the screen coming down. This is about the alarm receiver. One last thing, which is a very interesting example, is around is is about uh, battery check. So in this case, you'll see that I'm in a power check example, and the code for this is also shared. I'll show you at the end where to find which code. So this is very simple, you know. Uh, this uh, activity only has a text box, and whenever we change the battery, the text box value changes. That's what happens. So what we do is we register a receiver, a broadcast receiver. So this is how we create a new broadcast receiver. But the most important part is the intent filter. So we are saying that call my broadcast receiver when you have the intent whose action is battery change. Okay, only that time call my callback. Otherwise, you know, because I need to tell, I need to tell Android explicitly what I'm interested in. So here, what happens is I get the battery level from the level, and I just set the battery level on the text. You can see this example, and it's very simple to play with this example. So what I'm doing is, uh, I have uh, done a telnet connection to this emulator, and I can uh, give instruction to the emulator to change its own setting. So when you can see the screen, uh, you will see that the battery check application is running behind my behind. And I'll just say power capacity is 80%. And you can see the battery level changed to 80. And if I change the power capacity again to 30%, you will see the battery level change to 30. This is the example which I wanted to show in uh, in the droid to the example, and that's an interesting thing. So you can have your you can have a broadcast receiver to check the battery levels and do things accordingly. So that was the last example from the droid tweet tweet uh, 
uh, reference implementation. The entire, so this is the code.google.com project. So I'm moved on to a emulator. Uh, I've moved into my Chrome browser. So the address is code.google.com slash p slash droid tweet. So here you can see everything about droid tweet. So you can see the features which are there. You can also see actual videos of you know about list activity, how to go about them in detail. The problem is this uh, talk is more about the breadth. So I'm giving you maximum content on the breadth. And for the depth, you can go to this uh, site and look at uh, the video demos of each and everything. Here I've got a video demo of the application running and some of the screenshots of the application. And at the end, I also have the architecture diagram, which I was talking to you about. So all the contents for Droid Tweet, tweet are available over here. I'll soon add the content and the tutorial to do OAuth, so you guys can use it as a reference implementation in your own application. And with that, I will commence the talk for Dry tweet, uh, and the next topic is about uh, CDBM, which is a different topic. So uh, that ends this talk. Moving back to my presentation. change of topic to CDDM. Now CDDM stands for Cloud to Device Messaging. It's a new technology uh, from Google uh, launched I think half six months or a year back. It's, it's, uh, it's been in action since then. So what is C2DM? So in very simple terms, C2DM is a one-way message from the server to your application. Okay, it's a push message from your server to the application. It's not about your client talking to the server, but your server talking to the client. Second thing is these messages are very, very small. It's 1024 bytes, nothing much. So you cannot send loads of information to the client. It's only to tell the client that, okay, hey, there's something interesting happening on a server, you might want to check it out. So instead of doing polling, the way applications used to do polling, that every five minutes check and ask the server, hey, do you have something interesting? And again, after five minutes, anything yet? Anything yet? And it keeps on going like that. In c world, it's different. You tell the cloud that, okay, if you have anything interesting, let me know. And then the server lets you know when there's something interesting. Server will, say, server will say, hey, you got new updates, new tweets available, or new status available. Just check it out. A very small message says that. And then the client goes to the server and actually makes a restful call to get the information which it requires. Uh, another thing about C2DM is it's very, very optimized. So if you know, you must be, you must be wondering how is Gmail uh, syncing, how is calendar syncing uh, so efficient? So C2DM also uses the same channel. So every Android device has a channel with the cloud, which is very, very optimized. It takes a very less amount of uh, bandwidth and battery, and C2DM works on the same channel. So why C2DM? And to answer the why of C2DM, we need to look at the drawbacks of Droid Tweet, or any applications which are building like Droid Tweet. So Droid Tweet is a classic example of applications which polls. So the first problem with, uh, with application which poll is the battery drain. Now there's a constant challenge going on between you know keeping the application fresh, so keeping the data, data fresh and keeping the battery last long. So if the application is launching every 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, that's kind of uh, bad because even if my application is even if my phone is down in the sense that my phone my phone screen is off, 
I can't assume that my phone is not working. So if application launches itself every five minutes or ten minutes, it's going to wake up behind the scene and do some radio processing. It's going to look at the radio. It's going to look at the uh, internet. It's going to do those things which will drain the battery. And the worst part about this, this is that I'm doing it blindly. So I have no idea whether I have new information or I don't have new information. I'm just checking it just for the sake of checking it. And that's bad. There are ways to optimize uh, this uh, polling mechanism. So Android has recently, uh, recently added this alarm manager dot set in exact repeating. What it does is, uh, let's say I've got these three applications. Now first application launches every five minutes, second application launches every six minutes, and third application launches every seven minutes. Now what happens is that when these applications are launching uh, close to each other, my, de my device will stay awake for three minutes, and that's bad. So what inexact repeating does is it basically launches all these applications uh, together, let's say at six minutes takes average and you know it just makes it inexact not the, it doesn't make it make it exact so all these three applications launch together and in one minute they do, they do their job and they end so now I'm using less of the battery well this helps to an extent but this isn't on a problem that my application is still blindly checking for updates the second problem is data usage now more polling means more use of data, data. and it's not only a client side problem that the data usage uh, becomes huge. It's also a problem if the server isn't optimized for such kind of things. So if my server, let's say if I, ha if I have tweets for today and I ask the server that to give me tweets for today, my server is again going to give me the same tweets. So let's say I had 10 tweets in the morning and for uh, next three hours, every 10 minutes, I'm asking for the data, data. And server is again sending me the 10 tweets data. So I'm getting stale data which is substantial and it's repeating, so it costs me more bandwidth. Now, a way to optimize this is to ask the server to send data on top of what the client actually has. So let's say my last data was I got at 10 a.m. 33 minutes, 10.33 a.m. I got the last data. So my client should ask the server that get me data after 10.33 and not, not, not uh, you know, before that. Now, if I don't have any data, data the server call will happen but the package which I get would be empty. I feel that you had no data. So that will be more optimized. But again, this helps me so much because I'm still making these calls to the server. The last thing is about, the, not the last thing, the third thing is about the lag. Now, notification using polling will always result in lag. So I won't exactly get my notifications on time. So it, it ends up being a balancing act between saving the battery and keeping the data fresh. So if I keep the polling at one minute, sure, I'll get the latest information, but then I'm draining my battery you know, and, and using more, more data plans. So instant notification and polling, they don't exactly go hand in hand. So that's why you need to move away from notification, uh, from polling, not notification, polling. Now I'll talk about certain server side problems. Now we, I'm talking about this because uh, we recently moved uh, one of our product from polling to, uh, uh, to pushing. And this helps not only the client side but it helps the server side also. Think about it, you know, if I have um, um, an application where a lot of devices are having my application and the application talks to my own backend, every device, every n minutes is bombarding the service, the server. And for what reason? You know, Businesses won't mind traffic as long as it's adding real value, but this is not real value. It's just you know um, a stupid way of trying to figure out whether you have more information or not. And uh, my server will get loaded, and I can cater to more clients. On the other hand, if I'm if I'm avoiding that, and the server is telling only those ten users for the, them they have the information that for limited, only those ten users application are going to connect to the server and the load is going to be pretty low. So traffic is one aspect, the second aspect is the load. And I'm talking about the load when, which is involved in processing the request and hitting the database and also having you know, data, latency database fetch. So imagine this traffic gets in, it again is hitting all the database tables and you know, you're doing all these things. 
So servers need to optimize to know whether the polling requests will repeat every n minutes, and they only hit the database if they if there's a change for a particular user. So either you can have a separate table, uh, which is like an index table for a user, like when was the last time it, there was information for a user, you can hit that table, but that's still a database thing. Or you can keep an in-memory, uh, you know, cache, and figure out whether this user has some new information or not. These are the things which you can optimize. But again, this is more like a reactive way than a, than a proactive way. So what we really want to move towards is making our clients more reactive. We want to tell our clients, do this and do that. And the clients will do what the server is asking. Obviously, the clients will do it proactively whenever the, the client has more information. But otherwise, the clients need to be more reactive. Now, let's go to the CTDM architecture and how to go about building CTDM applications. So, CTDM has three players. One is the device itself. The second is the application server. And third is obviously the Google Cloud. But remember this fact that the user can have more than one device. I myself has have a tablet. Uh, I have a Zoom tablet. I have an iPad, and I have my Nexus S phone. So I have all these things. So a, a user has more than one device. You need to remember that, and there's a reason behind that. I'll show that in a while. So these are the three players, which you have: device, application, server, and cloud. Let's look at the CTDM flow of events. So the step one is. The application server wants to send a CTDM message to the device. So the Google Cloud needs to know the identity of the application server. For this, what we do is we go and register a Gmail address with Google Cloud saying, hey, this is the guy who will send you CTDM messages. And that email account, the Gmail account, becomes the identity of the application server. So you need to create a special Gmail account just for that. I need to register that with the cloud. Now, once you register that, the first step is when the application server comes up, it needs to authenticate with the Google Cloud with the login name and password. So that's called as client login. So client login is a mechanism by which Google allows fat clients or backend servers to authenticate with Google. So once that authentication happens, the application server gets a security token. And it needs to send a security token next time when it's trying to send a message to actual device. So the application server needs to note it down and make it, you know, keep it with itself. The second step is that the device needs to tell the cloud that I am a device who is interested, or it's you can talk about the application, not the device. Uh, so look at a device as application in this case. So I've used a device one, but think about it as application one. So the application registers itself with Google CTDM saying, he, hey, I'm interested in receiving messages from the cloud. So then Google Cloud says, OK, I have noted it down. This is your ID. If somebody wants to send to you a CTDM message, you need to tell him that send it to this particular ID. That way I will know that this message is for you, and I'll send the message to you. So once the device or the application gets to know its own registration ID, it will communicate with the application server. And it will tell the application server information about it, its own, you know, who who logged in and what is the registration ID. Rohit, we are experiencing some audio problem here. We are unable to hear you. Uh, 
Uh, Rohit, can you hear us? Uh, there's some audio problem. We are unable to hear you completely. Now, the device knows that. Okay, this is the time. Can you hear me now? Uh, now it's okay. Correct, for you now. Okay. Note that. I'll just track back a little, little bit because I think you must have lost a couple of slides. So let's track back a bit. So the cloud now sends this message which the application server sent to the cloud saying that okay, the server has something interesting for you. So please uh, get back to us. And this is a time when the device knows that okay, I need to go and you know get my new scraps from the server. Okay. And this is how things really work out in the C2DM world. So the first setup is between the application server and the cloud, where the application server gets its token from the cloud. The second step is when the device gets its own identity from the cloud. And device tells the server that this is my identity on the cloud. So send it to send it send the message to this identity on the cloud so I'll receive it. The good factor about this is if the application server sends a message to the uh, particular application, registration ID and the device is off, Google Cloud will queue it up. And when the device comes up again, it will get these things. So I don't even have to queue up things at my application server level. And that's a good part about things. So let's look at the CTDM demo. And uh, it's a live demo. So for this, I'm having two emulators with me. So in the first emulator, I'm launching my app called Social Me. And here, My sign-in information is this. So I'm trying to uh, sign up from this application itself. So I'm saying that I want to sign up with my name as Rohit Kartol and my username and my email address as this and I say sign up. Now once I do this, I can go to this site and you will see that, you know, You can see on the site, I'm now, now move, move back to my uh, Chrome window. You can see that we are listing Rohit Ghatol as an entry over here. That's from the first emulator which we are doing it. Now I'm going back to my second emulator. And here also, I'm trying to launch social media application. And here I have a different email address. Note that these email addresses need to be proper and your device needs to be registered with this particular email address. So if you don't have that, things don't work. So these are not any dummy email addresses. It needs to be the Google uh, email address by which a device is registered because that's how things will be known. So I, I'm signing up with Rahul Khatri and some other email account. I'm going back to my Chrome browser and I'm showing the list of all social users. So this is the area where you know all my social users you know can be seen. So there are a couple of questions which I'm facing. One is uh, call is can we have our own transport uh, mechanism in device? And what is the procedure to use our own cloud uh, mechanism? So the thing is, uh, the answer to this question is very simple. You can have your server on, on any cloud. Your transport mechanism, um, you know, C2DM, so the simple thing is the transport mechanism is fixed in case of C2DM. So that's the answer to Ravi, uh, Ravi Shri Hari Babu, uh, that the server has to send the information to the cloud in a particular manner, which is Google Cloud. And Google Cloud will then send information to your application via an intent. So that's fixed. 
that cannot be changed. Okay. And uh, second question is, what is the procedure to use our own cloud mechanism? So there is no provision to use your own cloud mechanism, but if you mean that, can you use your, uh, can your server be on any other cloud? Yes, it can be. But this mechanism is perfectly, uh, what do you call it, it's uh, strictly fixed and you have to use Google Cloud and Google, uh, you know, accounts to do that. So there is no other way of doing that. So here you can see uh, my list of social users, two entries available. And if I take you to this uh, another tab which says social user registration, this, uh, so I'll see entries over here when I actually do a login. And I'll go to my second emulator and I'll do a login over there also. And you will see that both my uh, applications are logged in. And after the logged in, they actually ask the Google Cloud, give, your, give us our identity. So these are the identities which they got. These numbers are much bigger, but they are cut by this application. So don't worry about these numbers, they are actually way too big than this. So this is what I saw. Now, if I want to send a message to a particular user, I have this option of two users. One is Rohit Khatul and one is Rahul Khatri. So I'll say send a message to Rohit Khatul. And it's in the message to Rohit Ghatul, and I think you can see that on my Chrome browser. And then what we'll do is we'll go to the first simulator, and I'll wait for you, to, you guys to just catch up. So my emulator has now launched, uh, and you can and there's a icon coming on a notification where you can see that I have got this notification called as new message received. Now this is a CTDM message which came in to my broadcast receiver and my broadcast receiver put a notification on the notification bar. So when I click on, th when I click on this, you can see that my activity now response with this message key, okay, the message I got is please upgrade your application. This is what happens with uh, the first user. Now when I switch to the second user and I say the same thing, now it's changed this thing to message successfully to Rahul Khatri. I'll go to the emulator again, but the second emulator in this, in this case, whose identity is with Rahul Khatri and I go there and you will see the same thing happening over there. Okay, so that was the demo and I'll go back to the presentation to show you the actual steps. So if you guys are really interested in learning how to do this uh, and many of the questions which people have is can I use some other uh, other uh, cloud platforms to, to do the same thing will be answered when I show them the particular steps. And these steps are very, very uh, tied down to Google Cloud. Think about it like, you know, like when you develop application for Google App Engine, you have to tie up to some of the Google APIs it's more or less in that particular fashion. But in this case, it's not so bad because Android, uh, so Google is a major company behind Android. So that support will always be there. And uh, mobile companies, mobile platforms are kind of, you know, more or less propriety in their, in their approach. So we don't have to worry about, you know, tying onto a cloud. Uh, as we have to worry about, you know, making a web applications tying onto a cloud. So it's more or less kind of okay in this case. So let's go to the slide called steps to CTDM. And here the first step is which you need to be very careful about is many people make a lot of mistakes when they uh, you know do this. You have to create, create an emulator with uh, Google API, uh, API level 8 and not Android 2.2 API level 8. So it has to be Google API because Anything Google puts extra, apart from Android platform, goes into Google APIs. So because this depends on, uh, because CTDM depends on the, the phone should have an Android market, that's why you're going to use Google API for this. That's the first thing which you need to take care of. The second thing which you need to take care of is your uh, emulator needs to have a Google account, a proper Google account. If you don't have this, things won't, won't work out for you. So, as I mentioned, the step number two is that the server needs to authenticate uh, with uh, Google. 
So in this case, I'm I'm kind of trying trying to build a query string, which is like or, or a post string, which is like you know what is the email address? It's uh, the same account which I registered with uh, CDDM. It's the same Gmail account which I registered with CDDM. The same password of that account. And this is the backend code. This is your uh, web application code. This is your Java or PHP code talking to the backend. And the account type is Google. Uh, the service is ACDM. This is this has to be mentioned to Google. And this is uh, Google uh, client login APIs. So anybody who wants to any backend or any fat client when they want to authenticate with Google, they use the same API. So we are doing a post and then we are putting uh, uh, the, 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 the data basically in that. And we are sending the data to, to Google in the post. And as a response of that, we get uh, um, a line starting with auth equal to. That line uh, will contain the Google's authentication token. And this is one-time code. So one-time uh, thing. So when application server starts up, we can do it, do authentication with Google and keep this uh, thing with it. So your backend is not talking to, to Google for sending cloud to device messaging. Step three is that your Android manifest needs to be done in a particular manner. Now I won't go into the details of the screens and everything, but I'll typically talk about things which are very, very much required by CDDM layer. So first thing is you need to have a minimum SDK level as eight, because Froyo and above, this is supported. Below it's not supported. Um, now what happens is uh, when uh, the cloud is sending, so when you're registering for CDDM, it also asks you the package name. Now what is the package name? of your application. So that account is linked to not only uh, you know uh, to your application server but also linked to the package name of your Android application. So Google will send uh, that intent only for uh, you know only for application which has a permission as the package name dot permission dot c2 the message. So my package name was com dot sparkletics dot factorial. It was my package name. So the permission is for com sparkletics permission dot c2dm message. So I'm not only supposed to declare that permission, but I'm also supposed to consume the same permission. That's only when I'll get the message from the cloud. Apart from that, I need to have permissions to actually make, uh, to receive a c2dm uh, you know, intent, and I need to have an intent permission. So these permissions are very, very important. Without this, things won't work out. The second thing is you need to have an intent receiver, and uh, this intent receiver needs to handle two kind of responses. So one is that it needs to definitely receive the c 2 d messages coming from the cloud. So this is declared by the uh, com.google.android.c2dm.intent.receive action. And the cat category will be my application itself. And the second intent is when, uh, when the application requests Google Cloud that, okay, give me the identity, uh, this is the intent which is fired. So com.google.android.c2dm.intent.registration. This is when the application traps, okay, what is my registration ID? And from here, it sends it to our application server. These two are very important. So the same Rocker receiver handles registrations which come from Google Cloud and messages which come from the Google Cloud. And this is Android code. That was Android. Uh, this is a manifest file. Now, application when it launches, this is again Android code. I marked it specifically. What is Android code? What is server code? This is again Android code. So here, I'm sending an intent saying that I want to register to C2DM, uh, and the application is myself, and the sender is the Gmail account or device. And I want to launch this particular service. And this sender can be received from uh, Android API itself. So you can get the identity of the user from the Android API itself. So there's a provision for that. So you don't have to hard code this. And you don't even have to know this pretty much. Mm. So now, when I send that particular intent, after some time, my broadcast receiver is called because I got the response for the registration event. Now in this case, I get a registration ID in the intent string and also get the error string. If I don't have any error, and if it's not an unregistered, um, what do you call, ID, I'll go and send my registration ID to the server. So I'll open HTTP connection from the last, you know, else if registration ID is not equal to null, 
I will open HTTP connection and send my registration ID to the server for the server to put it down. Server will have some kind of database where it, will, it, it should keep the first my user ID uh, on the server. Um, what's the kind of device I have because that kind of demographics is also useful for the, for the server. So I'm ready to sell what kind of device I have because I can have a number of devices. It's good to know that demographics. And ultimately this registration ID. Uh, the September 6 is once this is done and the server knows about uh, that I have these particular users and these users have these particular applications running on these devices via the registration ID. The server now decides that okay, I need to send some information to this device. So the first part is to create uh, a data. So the data is uh, nothing but a, uh, but a string which says registration ID is equal to this registration ID. Collapse key is zero. I'm sorry, I don't know much about collapse key over here. It's for, for copy paste. And ultimately, the data dot payload is some message which I'm sending in UTF-8 format. So the main thing is, is the registration ID and the data payload. See, over here, I don't have to mention. I don't have to mention anything about uh, uh, about the user over here because I got the identity of the application from the uh, from the from the application itself, and Google Cloud knows about this. Then I'm going to open a connection with uh, Android dot clients at Google dot com c two dm send. And then I'm going to post my data to that particular uh, URL. And that's it. The message gets queued up on the server, uh, on the Google Cloud, and immediately goes to the device. If the device is not running, the message actually stays on the cloud. And when the device comes up, the message goes, and uh, the device, the application, receives the uh, message. And the application now knows that it needs to do some, take some action, depending on the message which is sent by the server. If the action is that, okay, come to me and fetch your straps, then the application will go and make a RESTful call to the service, fetch the information, and do things. So when that happens, uh, again, my broadcast receiver is called. The same broadcast receiver is handling two things. That's why I'm having this if and else condition. So in this case, if the intent uh, action is C2DM intent receive, that means here I'm actually getting the payload. And the, I can read the payload and I can decide from this payload what I need to do. In my case, I'm getting a notification and firing. So it launches a notification on the notification bar. And that's how things work out for me. And this is again the broadcast receiver. Same broadcast receiver with if else. One for, one for registration, one for receiving the message. And that concludes the C2DM thing. So as a conclusion, I'll read out some things for C2DM, and uh, then we can have a Q&A round, and you can ask me questions. Uh, so the first thing about C2DM is it's an excellent way to reduce the data usage and save battery on a device. So it definitely helps the device, you know, application be more efficient, but it also reduces the load on the server. So what happened in our company is we were working on a SaaS-based application where we used to pull and uh, we are doing some kind of a hanging get to simulate a push. But that didn't work out very well for us. And the load from the device and the load from the uh, server was still, you know, kind of there. Although our server was very optimized, uh, server had, uh, uh, server knew what's new for each, uh, each user of the, of the platform and the server used to keep the information in memory. So that server was kind of efficient. But the device was still in a, in a mess. The application was still in a mess, client side application. So we moved to C2DM, and uh, from there on, it's it's like you know, the application is not running until it's not supposed to run, and when it's running, it does the thing which it needs to do, and just goes back to sleep. Also, when the device goes offline, uh, our servers don't have to worry about things. So they will just you know tell tell the Google Cloud, okay, there's a message for that. Deliver it to the device whenever you can. The device comes up, and uh, the application receives the intent. And the application says, "Okay, I got some. I need to do something, and it connects to the server to uh, fetch new information. And definitely, this is a better option than polling. So that's where um, you know I would like to conclude the C2DM uh, demo. Uh, there's a very good article by uh, a person on this site called as Wagela.b. Probably that's a person's name." He has explained the cloud to device messaging in 
in a lot of details. So people who want to implement that should uh, use this as a reference point in the official Android uh, guide. Or you can just pick up, pick up my reference implementation from Android C2DM reference IMP. It has both the server and the client code in it. So you can run that. The server code is written using Spring Group. So you require Maven to run it. That's what you require. And the client side code is pure Android. So you can just import it and run it. So a couple of, uh, so I'll talk, to, I'll talk to you about this code projects uh, which I'm referring to. They're all listed over here. The Droid project is listed at uh, Droid Tweet. The Android code samples are also there in Droid Tweet itself on the main page. The thumbnail in the list view, uh, the blocking queue example is in this feed reader which we had created some time back. And the C2DM server and Android applications are at Android C2DM reference amp. So that's where I'll stop and I'll ask you, let you ask some questions. Okay, so I already have some questions and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start looking at them. So is this a sticky intent receiver? Um, so sorry Ravi, I'm not very well versed with sticky intent receiver. I, I do work on Android, but this is a very particular question. Um, I, I know about services being sticky. I don't know about intent receivers being sticky. So I'm sorry, I, um, I will have to look, look this up and find it out. But this is, the, the way I answer this question is this is like you know, any, any intent receiver. It's any broadcast receiver actually. So whatever intent filter you put in for that, it, it receives that particular thing. Next question is, can we mention permissions out of receiver in the manifest file? Um, I still, I need to understand the question much better. Can you mention permissions out of receivers in manifest file? The question is again from Ravi. Um, Ravi, why don't you explain that question, put it back over here. I'll go to the other question and come back to you on that, okay? So just explain the question and, and uh, the next thing is from Windu. Uh, Windu is saying, a great webinar, could you please let us know uh, some great according to your reference material for Android apart from developer and Android.com. So yes, I have just posted in the end of the presentation, you can see that uh, there is a, uh, I have posted a number of uh, things over here. So I'll also tell you where to find this presentation. So uh, what I know is uh, Bharat from uh, TechGeek is recording this, this entire thing. I'll also hand it over this presentation to him. So he'll put a presentation. Uh, this presentation is also available on uh, on my so you know my all of you guys know my tech gig account right so if you go to my activities in my tech gig account you can see that the present there's a there's a thing which I'm showing over there which is that my presentation is already on slide slide share so what I've been showing to you is already there on slide share and it's been put on tech gig so next question is from Gaurav uh, he's saying, after completing seminar, can you please give me proper directions on how to get a updated, how, how to get updated on mobile cloud computing field? I'm completely new to this field. So, uh, sure, Gaurav. So, you know, uh, cloud and mobile, they are like, you know, they're the best buddies right now. So, cloud doesn't uh, mean much if you don't have mobile to it. That's what, that's my point of view. So, think about this. Uh, if you have so we all started with restful services. We all started with web applications where web applications were, uh, you know, like uh, used to have posts and used to go to different pages and the entire page used to refresh. Then from there we moved to Ajax based web applications and uh, Ajax web based web application gave rise to this restful APIs. Typically JSON is a good example to start with. So uh, you can always go to programmableweb.com and uh, and look at various services which are which are there. So there you will find number of RESTful services. So good way to start is you start writing client applications for uh, these services. So let it be Google Places, let it be Facebook, let it be Foursquare. Try to understand the nature of uh, the cloud uh, itself and uh, the RESTful nature of the cloud and start writing applications for that. 
The next step would be that you yourself are like launching web applications which have restful interfaces from the cloud. And you need to read about a number of things like you know memcache uh, and and uh, you know newer things like uh, NoSQL databases that will give a complete picture of what the cloud really is. So you need to start with uh, these particular fields, but uh, and you can launch your uh, cloud applications, uh, your web applications on uh, Google's cloud, which is, which is uh, Google App Engine. If it's Microsoft, you can launch it on Azure. And if you want to be be independent of these two, you can go to Amazon Cloud, which is an excellent platform, although it's paid. So question for uh, Shukuru uh, Sen Senkuru Abhishek is what is polling? So polling, uh, like uh, polling, is very simple. Uh, polling is like like uh, you're going again and again asking it. You are checking that do I have I have an update? So let's let's say on Twitter I have got this restful service which tells me what do I have. So I keep on going to the service back and back. So polling is just doing a repeating action, you know. Again. So next question is from Gagan. He's saying I'm using C2DM in a project. Uh, I'm working on. I need to invoke an app from my own app on receiving a message from C2DM. So Gagan, I assume you have got a couple of applications. Uh, so that's not uh, too difficult. So what happens if you've got two applications uh, from the same company and you expect users to you know, install, the, install both applications to get more features? Then what you can do is uh, one of your uh, the application which you want to invoke, uh, in the activity you want to invoke, you can put an intent filter and use an implicit intent. So typically when you navigate from one activity to another activity, you use explicit intent where we say that I want to invoke this particular activity and you give the package name of that activity. In otherwise, you had to use implicit intent, where uh, you say that my activity can respond to this kind of uh, action and category, so anybody can invoke that particular activity, and then you use intents from the application which has been invoked by CTDM to launch that particular intent implicitly. So use implicit intents over there to do this. So uh, again, uh, one more question from Santoro is what is the difference between polling and server request? Not much difference. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't explain the word polling. Uh, when you when you do server request uh, in a periodic, periodic manner, that's called as polling. Nothing else. Next question for uh, Parvesh is how can we maintain sessions in Android? Sign in and sign out uh, functionality. A very good question, in fact. So typically, what happens is uh, uh, I'll answer the question for both the cases. So you know. Um, the RESTful servers, you know, every decent Android application has a RESTful server behind that. It's like saying every successful man has a, you know, woman behind that. <laughs> That's the energy which I'll use. So your RESTful service, uh, your services are not open. They need some kind of, you know, authentication. So typically when you are, if you're a JTW developer, you will think about that I've got a JSession ID uh, and I've got a session and I'll use that. In case of RESTful, what will typically happen is you authenticate once with the RESTful service and you will get a token. And then every time you talk to the server, you'll put the same token uh, you know, uh, in the HTTP header. And that's how authentication works. So sessions, there are not any sessions out there because uh, uh, you know, it's a stateful nature. So HTTP is anyway stateful nature, but the browser maintains that. That's why you feel that there's a session. In case of vendor application, every request is an independent request which has the token inside the HTTP header. Okay. That's how uh, sessions would work in Android. And you will store these uh, tokens when, once you get the token in your shared preferences. And for added security, you can make tokens expire from the server and after a day or two. So the application needs to again fetch the tokens. So the application, uh, uh, you know, your application should not ask the user for username and password unless uh, you also have the backend server. So if you have the backend server and you are launching the same application, then it's okay for your application to store the user and password. If it's if you're working with Twitter and anything, you will always uh, you know uh, take the user to the browser, do OAuth, and store the tokens. And, and, and when the token expires, do the same thing again. So Vijay is talking about connection pool and uh, pooling. Uh, no, it's pooling. 
So I'm sorry I'm, I'm kind of confused you guys with that word, but it's just, you know, I'm just hitting the server again and again, and, you know, after update, that's what I'm in the polling. So next question from Atul, very good question. What happened, what happens if push sends multiple time in an interval of some time, an application is in background at the time of all push send? So I think the question which you're trying to ask Atul is, what if I send too many push and what is the order in which they come? So first of all, uh, there is no order maintained. So push should only happen when there's something substantial happening on a server, but it won't maintain any order. And even, even if the application is in background, the application will come up because an intent is fired. So ultimately, um, it doesn't really matter whether the application is running or not running. The way broadcast receivers work is whenever the intent is fired, uh, Android will look out at okay, who, which are broadcast receivers can actually you know be called. So it calls your broadcast receiver. So it doesn't really matter whether your application is running, not running in the background, and uh, CDD messages are not uh, they do not come in a serialized fashion. So you know you can. There's no guarantee of that. So pra Pravesh is asking for uh, any sites or link where I can read more information. So I already told that uh, there's uh, go to my TechGeek uh, homepage uh, because you guys must be already having it. There I mentioned uh, I have put my slide on slash slide share and you can read from there. And my slide at the end has the uh, has the links to other sites where you can read from. So Gavin is asking this question, um, what is pending intent? So think about this, so pending intent is more like a, you know, a wrapper intent. So, so I want to launch my service after every five minutes. Now I can't tell the alarm manager to launch my service directly. And there are some reasons behind that, I won't go into deep into that. But what happens is alarm manager requires a special kind of intent which it needs to repeat. So pending intents are wrapping intents over actual intents. Because you can't give the actual intent to the alarm manager, you have to give pending intent to the alarm manager. Similarly, for notification also, you can't give the actual intent. So when I put a notification, my intent is to actually uh, launch an activity. That's my original intent. And I'll wrap this intent by a pending intent, saying pending intent or get activity in that case and give it to my notification manager. So next question by Vijay, uh, he's asking, can we use Twitter app inside my app as integration? So um, I'll answer the question in a different manner. See, uh, we shouldn't think about using somebody else's app or somebody's code base inside our code base. I'll give you an example. Let's say you are playing a game, like you are, you are working for a game company and you're developing a game called a Sudoku and suddenly your boss comes and says, in this Sudoku game, I want to put, put a functionality so that I can share my score uh, with my friends on SMS or email. Let it be a stupid requirement, but let's go with that requirement. That's Sudoku game is to have ability to send my high score to my friends and my uh, uh, work colleagues or uh, uh, email or SMS. Now immediately you guys will start thinking that okay, I need to implement uh, uh, the email uh, code or I need to implement the SMS code. That's not how applications work on Android. So what you should do in that case is simply put a button in your application and when you click on a button, you should create an intent. And the intent should be an implicit intent. Saying, so your intent is, for, is shouting to Android, that is there anybody who can help me send the email? Or is there anybody who can help me send the SMS? So when you throw that intent, you also give some information. So when you throw that intent for email, is there somebody who can help me uh, send the email? I want to send an email to Vijay MR, and my subject is this, and my uh, body is this. Now Android will look for any application uh, who has an activity with a matching intent filter. So let's say you have a three email application installed for some reason. Android will open all three unless you are chosen one as default and give you option to use any one of them. And then you can choose one of, one of them by default also. So the way integration works in the ecosystem is by broadcast receiving and by intent filters on activities. That's how you should think, Vijay. So Atul is asking the question that in, my, in his previous question when he said key, some intents, uh, some pending intents are, sorry, some CTDM messages are being sent. So let's say I'm sending 20 CTDM message in a, in a period of five seconds. So how many will uh, my application get? 
So uh, quite frankly, your application will get all the internal messages. In what order, I cannot say. Because I've seen that. So that kind of completes a list of questions. Yeah. That kind of completes a list of questions which we have. And we only have five minutes running, uh, remaining, and you know we have uh, kind of uh, 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 we have kind of uh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. With I mean, uh, uh, time. Uh, we whatever questions which we have received so far, we answered all of them. Sure. So I'm just putting a slide uh, where I'm putting my Twitter uh, and tech geek IDs. So if somebody wants to note it down and contact me later on. You guys, are few, you guys can do that. So I'm just putting this last slide, and uh, when you see that, uh, you can end the end the presentation. So thanks, guys. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, very good questions from all of you. I appreciate uh, you waiting for two hours and you know patiently listening to me. And I hope uh, you guys liked it and must have learned something from this presentation. Thanks. So, Bharat, over to you.